was wondering, in view of the shifting of men and women's responsibilities now, do the laws of inheritance in Quran still stand as is? Does your son get twice as much as your daughter, or do you know? Is do, can we shift things around? Are we going to get punished? I'm sorry, I'm taking you on a totally different yeah, sphere. But no, no, that's, that's a really uh, important. But it's a very, it's a very tough question because. Um, You know, the, 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 it's a separate issue of whether the state, when you have the countries like Tunisia or Egypt or whatever, whether they, they change their laws or not, because in these countries, the issue is not so much legal as political. When they, when they change these laws, they are um, weakening the position of Sharia and the relevance of Sharia in their society. And it, it, it's, it's not the issue of the merits, but the, the, the political significance of Sharia itself. Um, because the, the, these countries are, don't come to, to that question while honoring Sharia, they come to it often to undermine and undercut Sharia as, as, as a symbol in society. That's, so that's a separate question from the, the, the question of are these laws changeable? And, and again, I don't want countries, the current governments in the Middle East to change these laws because they're very corrupt governments and they, they are largely governments that are, are uh, you know, they, they're colonial agents they're, and colonialism has always targeted the tradition of Sharia. But the, the question on the merits, the, the substantive question, you know, uh, that specific, in many cases, women inherit as much as men do, but it is in the case of sons and daughters is where the the the, the woman inherits half of what a man inherits, and that's significant because then the issue in whether a woman inherits the the, the issue of the of, of female inheritance. It is not that Allah wants women to be half of men in every situation. So there was a specific legislation in the case of children. And of course, you know, the, 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 when you look at the, the root of these laws, um, the normative progress was that daughters inherit period because at that time in Arabia, especially daughters, unlike other situation like, like aunts and uncles, would not inherit at all. So uh, the thing that troubles me the most is that the women had a legal right to sue family members for their sustenance. So if, if a woman was destitute if, uh, uh, and she was a, 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 a widow or unmarried and she could actually sue her parents, she could sue her uncle, she could sue her brother if she didn't have other means of support. And there was a very, I mean, and often you didn't even need to file a lawsuit because there was a very strong cultural, um, social institution that made sure that women uh, were, had sufficient welfare in society. In our modern society, what often bothers me is that women are left without a support group and left 
quite powerless. And I personally, the, the uh, I see all the Quranic inheritance laws as laws that intended to empower members of society um, through the distribution of wealth, and and so. I w if I had a daughter and a son, I would not write in my will that a daughter should inherit half of my, what my son inherits. I would give them equal shares. And I would give them equal shares and I, and I would believe in, in today's circumstances where women are, are often far more vulnerable than men in the in the in social context and in the workforce, uh, and in fact, I mean, it, it, the, the the issue of wills and how much you can, you what, how much you can actually dispose of in your own will, it's a very big question. But but personally, I would not have a problem giving my daughter an equal equal share. Um, I mean, if if a if a daughter if if your daughter is let's say married and you know that she's in in good situation and is not in need, and you're not worried about her social network, then I would let the Quranic um, literal Quranic injunction apply, and then that half share that she gets. Or half of what her brother gets, she, basically she'll put in the bank as savings, as security for the rest of her life. But if that's not the situation where she would be able to just put that money in the bank as a security and as, as a safety network, uh, then I, I would give her uh, an equal share. I, I think that Quran, inherited laws became a symbol for Islamic identity just because. Islam was eradicated in so much of civil society, in so many things, and so we, we you know, we, we fight for the last symbolic remains of Islamicity. But from a legal perspective, I, I don't think that you can, you know, you can defend the half share in our day and age in all situations. It, it would have to you have to look at the social context, you have to look at the condition that you know, the particular women at issue are in, um, and you have to look at the fact that in most situations now, in most Muslim countries, a woman would not have a cause of action for maintenance against an uncle or a brother. Um, most, most Muslim countries follow French law. And in French law, there is no such cause of action. You can't sue your brother to take care of you, older or younger, or an uncle. And even it, 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 it's very questionable whether you can even force a father to maintain you under the, the, the inherited French laws that we took, um, which is a problem. It's a problem because, you know, in, in real life, you meet a lot of women that are in, in horrible shape, and in fact, if we, if we stopped following French law so blindly and thought of our own circumstances, I think we would be able to reduce the, the, the percentage of situations where women t turn to prostitution. Because basically they, they have family members, but they, their family members don't take care of them. And, and that, that's... And that's Dr. Abul Fadl, you issue. can't say, oh, well, that's their issue with Allah, the woman has to, you have to do what's right. Because like you say, then you're putting the person in a very disadvantaged situation. So I'm so happy that, you know, we have this open-mindedness, you know. It, it's, uh, I mean, it, every, for, uh, in my methodology, everything has to be founded on ethics, because I understand Allah's message as a message of liberation, meaning a message to achieve justice. And, and I believe that you can 
in many situations, rationally understand what justice demands. You know, there, there, there are there are situations where I would say, well, here I, I don't think reason can apply. But in most cases, where you you end up with hukuk and abad, and I don't, you know, I don't believe that inherited laws involve hukuk law. I mean, traditional Islamic jurisprudence tells you, no, hukuk law is involved because there is a direct command in the Quran, and so the rights of God apply, the rights of human being, it's a mixed right. But I, I, I think that that's methodologically a, a very flawed approach to the text of the Quran. When it comes to these organizing laws in society, Allah revealed them for our benefit. Salah or Psalm, these are for, for Lillah. These belong to Allah. We, we, we can't play around with them because these belong to Allah. But laws that apply to our social intercourse, our, our, our societies, these were, these were our laws that, that are human and for humans and, and, and must achieve human, and must achieve humanly comprehensible objectives. So, you know, if I don't understand the justice that it achieves, if, if it looks, if I, if I see it and it feels and I experience it as an injustice, it is an injustice. And so the same thing, for instance, with the issue of talaq. The, uh, I, I, you know, the Quran told us don't, don't leave women in this mu'allaqa state where they're basically neither married or divorced, nor divorced. but do you know how many cases of gross abuse where a husband refuses to divorce his wife and then it's held to go to court and try to get a divorce or even if the, if the wife doesn't want to get a divorce because she doesn't want to lose the maintenance from her husband, but she's abused and mistreated, and the husband just you know treats her like she's just a piece of furniture or garbage. And I think when you treat these laws, like the laws of talaq, as hukuk law, as, and so you can't touch them, I think we, we, we commit a great offense against Islam. Because Islam then appears very unreasonable and unjust. The problem, though, is, is that we all have the colonial uh, complex in our mind because colonialism destroy, destroyed Sharia institutions. And we innately or intuitively don't want to see Sharia further eroded. So, you know, every time I hear about the Egyptian government, for instance, or the Syrian government wanting to cancel out another Sharia rule, I see it as an injustice because I, I see it as once again the, the, the state is attacking the position of Islam in society. And if there was a democratic government, then our governments were, were, were actually represent the people and represent the, 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 what the people want. Then you would apply. You could start thinking about Islamic law in rigorous analytical ways, and not be so worried all the time about an authoritarian state. Yet once again, you know, moving in onto the space of Islam and 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 eating it up and swallowing it and, and destroying the, the faith, because that's what they, they they do. But for Muslims that are living in the West, Muslims not living in an authoritarian state. We have an obligation to think of Islamic law normatively, yani what should be, from the point of view of justice. And and so when I say these things, you know, when someone comes and says, well, are you saying that what your opinion should be applied in Egypt, or should be applied in, in, in Syria? I say no, because if I was living in Egypt, my position might be, could be very, very different. Uh, because of the situation, this is my opinion because I'm here. 
for Muslims here. And Muslims here, Sharia cannot stand for injustice. We cannot allow Sharia to become an agent for suffering and incomprehensible concepts of, of make-believe justice. Yeah, and the same thing um, in the way we treat women in mosques. I mean, you people in, in this society, you really come and you want, you want to apply the rule that women are in the back of the mosque behind some type of sitar, with some type of separator. That, by its nature, in, in ours, in this society, is deeply alienating and deeply uh, uh, undermines the sense of a salat al mustaqim for people. I mean, how, how could a woman feel, you know, outside the mosque, I can be a person, and I step into the mosque and suddenly I'm not a person anymore? And how can we stay, how can we say this is Sharia? You know we can't. We we read it. It's and you know either you have Muslims who don't know Sharia at all and they they just you know shoot from the hip or speak from whatever, or those who know Sharia they either don't want to uh, uh, create waves, or if they despair. They, they don't want to create waves, and they, they leave the entire, they become basically, they go and work in the secular world, yeah. where, where they write books about Sharia, sometimes say very daring things, sometimes, you know, but they're, they are, the Muslims are no longer their audience, and they don't, they don't care whether Muslims hear, their, hear them. And I think that's, that's really, yani, it, it, it's a shame, because I, I you know, I, I, I see so many people, for instance, write about Jewish law. Not one of them writes saying, well, I, I don't care if, if Jews is, are not my audience. Every academic book I, that I know about Jewish law is written with a Jewish audience in mind. Even the, the most sophisticated philosophical perspective it, it addresses Jews first and foremost, and same thing was uh, even the books about uh, natural law. I mean, uh, Robert George, if you read all his books, on that, uh, he cares about his Christian audience first and foremost. And then comes the, you know, all, all the rest. And it, sadly, we don't have that in among Muslims and scholars. You know, either you're not a real scholar and then you know, you just go to one of these make-believe Muslim places and you shoot from the hip. Or you're a real scholar, so you give up on Muslims and you go off and you write books that are published by Cambridge and whatever, that, that you no longer care whether you talk to Muslims or heard by Muslims. But, you know, I think that's... Uh, and I, I mean, also... Uh, you know, from the perspective of our, of our daughters, and we go to your daughter and tell your daughter, you know, I'm leaving my will, and I'm leaving you half of what your brother gets. It, for, it, for, uh, you know, it, unless the objective economic circumstances justify the decision, your daughter will feel a deep sense of grievance and unfairness and will not understand well, why, and it, as a situation that I once ran into, the daughter, was, the brother was in a much better economic condition than the daughter. And the parents were very, and, and of course she, she had a lot of bitterness and a lot of anger and blamed Allah for, for her already rich brother getting him you know, double of what she gets and she's in the end and she had kids and she was divorced and so on, and I, I, you know, I, I remember I told her, uh, her father when he was alive. I said, you know, don't do this. The, the, uh, Allah is not going to say in the final day, uh, you know, why did you give your daughter equal to what her brother to make? Uh, 
Allah is going, you know, is going to understand the, the, the issue of economic need and her children need to be raised. And, and in fact, I mean, I was actually trying to convince her because her, her brother was, was quite wealthy. I was trying to convince him to give her more, more than just even a, an equal share. But she had three children and no husband. And her husband was, had passed away or divorced. It was divorced. And the Arabs, you know, wasn't like giving her child support, and was a, he escaped to Egypt, and she never, you know. And technically, her brother should take care of her. Technically, her uncle, yeah, but, but nobody does. But nobody does. I mean, that, that's uh, I, I, you know, I was saying, you know, you could, you, you were saying, okay, well, I can put in my, we'll see, uh, that for the brother, make sure that your your sister is always well taken care of. And I said, yeah, sure, you could do that, but it's unenforceable. You know, she, it, it would be just a moral see. I mean, she, you can't, you know, she can't take that to court. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, unless you create a trust, for instance, yes. and that pays, but but that's, you know, if you're going to follow the literal meaning of that, then, then that's not probably, actually, you know, a trust could have been a good idea, but anyway, he, he didn't, I mean, he was one of these shiuch, he is actually here in LA. One, one of someone in the Islamic Center told him that this is like shares and it's written in the book. And can, you can't deviate from it. Yes. So we can give equal to the son, and I mean, you're very kind to give, and I'm not going to repeat fatwa or anything. It's just, you know, because I want to understand this logically. I, To me, I would be too embarrassed to tell a lawyer, you know, my daughter has. Uh, student loans, my son has, but give my son double. I mean, I'm like, she's going to say, where will you? No, give them equal shares. Okay. In, in, this, in this society, and in, in these circumstances, uh, give them equal shares. Thank you so much. Can I ask follow-up questions? Yeah. I have a question regarding, let's say, like a father who eventually on the deathbed found out that their children, or at least one of, their, one of his children, are not actually biologically his. Let's say for like DNA genetics and whatnot. So would he, the one who is not biologically or according to the DNA result, is actually not his? Would he get excluded, or is it the rule, you know, because of the same bed? Yeah, rule? you know, that, that's a that's a, a tough uh, juristic issue, but um, and there, there is a little bit of writing on it. I mean, there's not a lot, but. Um, I, in, from my view, if he raised them as their child and didn't learn about the fact that this child is not his child except through DNA, then he should forget the DNA test and the DNA test should never have been done in the first place. Uh, it's. The, the, the DNA, you know, I, I, DNA can be done for, for purposes that are legitimate, like, um, you know, for health reasons, medical reasons. You're looking for, uh, you know, possible defects or illnesses or whatever. But when, when, uh, uh, Establishing paternity in this way, I think, is is very problematic. Um, and I actually, you know, if, if I, when I have the opportunity, I tell parents, don't look at, don't look at the result. I mean, if you have a choice where to find out or not find out, don't look at it. Um, it, it is it is devastating to the to the child. It's devastating to the family. It destroys so much. But also, you know, when um, we have to revisit our entire issue of adoption in Islamic law for Muslims in the West, because following the, the letter of the law 
because adoption laws he require that you give them your own last name. I mean, mm -hmm. you, you go to, if you go adopt a child, you can't say, well, I'm going to adopt a child, but, you know, because then if you don't give them your own name, then you're a foster parent. You're not, a, you're not an adoptive parent. So what Muslims do is that they, they, they're out of the game. Very few Muslims, by the way, are, serve as foster parents. Very few Muslims adopt from the U.S. And that, that's sad because, you know, you actually do find children in orphans that belong to Muslims. I mean, for Muslim families, uh, they exist. And, um, and even if they're not Muslim, you know, it, it adopt, uh, taking care of an orphan is one of the highest moral things. You can go to Jannah just by taking care of an orphan. And in, in this society, the entire system of why we don't give the, the name, our name, to an adopted child and insist on, it, it, it just, it's in Muslim, among Muslims in the West, the entire system doesn't apply. So the short answer to your question is, I would give that child an inheritance if I raise them as my child, and I've always thought of this as my child, and I found out through a DNA test, Allah will reward you for treating that child like other children, and not discriminating against that child. What if the intention were to follow the Quranic law? Like, okay, not sure. No, 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 that, that's, the, uh, Allah did not order us to go and do DNA tests. And in fact, it, I mean, there, there are cases where you have doubt, you, your wife got pregnant, and you have doubt that this is your child. And there are a lot in Islamic literature that, tell, that basically says you are rewarded by Allah for not questioning and not investigating. It, 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 you could do a qasama where, where you basically, you take an, you know, if you're sure that this is not your child, then you take an oath accusing her, and then she takes a counter oath vindicating herself, and then the, the, if, if, you, if your purpose is dissolve the marital relationship. But this is a different issue. But you are, there is so much in, in the Islamic tradition that basically tells you it, it would be of good moral character. Allah would reward you for set for. Yeah, for, for basically forgiving your your spouse and saying, you know, I'm I'm not going to go on a prosecution to raise this to to find out whether this is my child or not, um, because it, it, there were a lot of cases like that where you know you, you haven't had sex with your wife and then she's pregnant and. They would. There, there are several fatwa like that. There were, you know, the husband basically goes to a mufti and says, you know, she could. This can't be my child. And the mufti say, would say, you know, Allah will reward you for treating this as your child anyway and not investigating. Getting a DNA test to uh, to target a child that you raised as your own uh, is, is, is immoral. I mean, it's wrong. It, it, this is a child you've raised in your home and that poor child thinks of you as your parent. And then you go get a, a test to, you know, ex, ex, dis, dis, 
destroy the, the life of this poor child. Uh, why? I, I'm just so, you know, no, it's, it's, we, uh, yeah, that, that, it, it's just, again, you know, it, beautiful things is a moral imperative. For us to be beautiful human beings is a moral imperative. And the, 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 the a, a jurist, a real jurist, can know about all the different opinions and points of view and all the evidence he, for this and for that, but a, a jurist within, especially in, in the context again of Muslims in the West, must always seek to produce results that are reasonable and that are fair and that are just. And there is nothing reasonable or fair and just in in, in, in you know, persecuting a, a, someone who, it's not their fault, that, you know, they grew up in a, it's not their fault that their mother might have done something years ago, or, you know, it, 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 why destroy their lives? So, Dr. how about where it says if your children are not Muslim, are not practicing Muslim, you, they should not inherit from you? Is, is that is that also an Islamic yeah, objection? The, the, this is um, um, whether they're, you know, if they're um, kuffar, um, you know, I, and again, I, I, um, I distinguish between Muslims in the West and, and Muslims uh, in Muslim countries. If I was in a Muslim country and someone came and told me, my child is outright a Kafir, says I'm a Kafir, um, and I don't want to allow them to inherit, I would support that. Um, but in, in this in country, like the U.S. Uh, or a Muslim, one Muslims in, in non-Muslims and Muslims in the West, the, we must be dua to our children consistently, and you know that if you disinherit them, you might lose them for Islam forever. Um, it, I mean, there's there's a little bit of a of a trickery here, or a little bit of um, in that I would I would avoid any situation that would absolutely resolve in my mind that my child is a kafir. Uh, in the and and in in the hope that they would return to Islam, and and I would always treat them like that. I mean, of course, there are there are exceptions where you know I, I years ago there was a guy, you know, his, his child was just um, not just uh, um, not praying and not whatever, but it's thought that had become sort of an Islamophobe, where, you know, working with Islamophobes, and I said no, deny them inheritance because they're, they're going to use this money and. In, in a way where they're fighting Islam. But that's different than a situation where a child is not, it, it, it has never been guided to Islam. You know, you, you, inherit, you give them their inheritance and with the prayer that this might facilitate their path back to Islam. And I would actually leave it will say, yeah, I would leave it with will and would say, you know, my, my Heartfelt desire is that you come back to Islam someday, because I worry about your hereafter, and I want to see you in the hereafter in the right place, and you know, and and the other thing that I would also do is do a kafara, meaning. Um, 
dedicate part of the inheritance to as a donation for Sabilillah as a um, as a kafara for the, you know the fact that you don't know where your money is going to be spent you know whether it is be spent on alcohol or spent on doing things like so the, the, you always do the, the, you know, they always purify money with donating in God's way for for, for God's cause. Um, donating a portion. Yeah. You know, you need that us for for your hereafter. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's so. I, I, it, it, I. You, you know, of course, if Allah wills, a child, of course, other than consistently doing du'a, and you know, sometimes people go through divorces or death or an accident or you know, some that brings them back to their faith. Yes. Um. And so, you know, when people say that they're not Muslim, in I when when people from Muslim parents say they're not Muslim, quite often I don't take them seriously because very few people really understand what kufr is, what what a true atheist is. I mean, to to actually believe in an atheist paradigm. Then you have to also believe that we are through the accidents that we are. There is n no moral imperatives. There are no moral absolutes. That you know, basically, every standard of morality is the product of some social negotiation that is endlessly renegotiable. Uh, that you really must, must believe in, in no higher power and no higher authority and that we're just purely accidents and that then there is no meaning and you know people like uh, um, um, uh, you know Harris uh, or um, what's the name of the other guy um, uh, uh, Hitchin, um, Christopher Hitchens Christopher Samuel Hitchens Harris. Samuel Harris you know, Steve yeah they, they, even then you know they, they philosophically like among the things that they philosophically end up having to accept is that also if you completely accept that we are there is no God and there is no objective purpose and so on that we also really don't have free will that we are just a product of our neurological network and so you know even the system of justice you're punishing someone for for really not having uh, a choice in what they do. They, they, they were a rapist from their their neural system, not because they have any type of free will. And as pe these these people are often admit, they say the biggest problem for athe atheism is the idea of free will, the, the, the idea of moral responsibility, and the idea of uh, accountability in, 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 in and of itself. A lot of times, our children, when they say they're not Muslim, it's because either they don't know or because they're they're let down. They, they feel a sense of grievance, yes. and and I don't believe in exasperating that sense of grievance. In you know, as long as they don't start, they don't become Islamophobes. I keep in you know I would just keep inviting them and inviting them and, and pray to Allah that because you have to believe that Allah truly if Allah wills Allah would have guided them and pray to Allah that will through for Allah to do a miracle perform a miracle and bring them back to Islam somehow and and Allah can perform miracles if Allah wishes. 
and you know, most you know, letdowns are from another Muslim. I know, you know the behavior that's really of another the, Muslim. That's a, that's a really sad thing. I mean, they, they get a sense of agreement and they become, they believe that there's nothing there more than they've experienced. And, and especially, I've noticed that it's among kids that tend to be smarter on the smarter yes. side, more accomplished side. You know, if I, I often wonder if I was not, had, if I didn't have the opportunities that I've had in life, to, if my Islam was basically going to Sunday and listening to these very tedious, very boring Quran tafsirs, and then basically getting together in the youth group and reading an ayah and then going around saying, okay, what do you think this means? What do you think is the meaning of this? Would I have been a Muslim? I mean, it, it, it's very, it's very not impressive. You feel like the okay, the, the, there's nothing there that really engages me. And then when when these same, in my experience, with things, these same kids, they discover that there is actually something in, in that is intellectually interesting and. They, they would have been very excited. Um, You're so right, Dr. Abufa. Lack of good leaders, good teachers, good um, and it, it for is, the highly intellectuals. It, it, you know, it, it, we our mosques are often uh, the way we structure them is to cater to. The as Ahmed often, as Ahmed said, uh, the uh, what, what, what uncles from Bangladesh or what else do you say? Uh, uncles from India, uncles from old uncles, or I forgot. He, he had like a funny expression to, but you know, the, these, 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 yes, you have to be a certain path, you know, children are all, do all pray, they're all, you know, it just has to be any deviation is like, oh, then you're out. What, what is what is what impresses a child most is role models and you have to have role models that impress a child that says it's cool to be Muslim but if if they always go to the Islamic Center and they see these you know old uncles that fight about meaningless things that are authoritarian in their nature intolerant themselves ignorant and it's such a turnoff I mean um, one of the, you know, one of the biggest pains of my life, Grace knows this, that um, there was a girl that I knew who was actually quite bright, very smart girl, and, and, and but she's an, an orphan, her father had died, and I thought that she was a very promising, and she was a muhajjama. And she used to go to um, the Qureshi camps, um, but she went from Qureshi camps to becoming a stripper. Can you believe that? And it, it bothered me so much because I used to help her memorize Surah Yasin in the old days. and. And I know why she went from that to a stripper. And it, it, because it, her consistent engagements with these uncle types convinced her that everything is hypocrisy, that you know, it, it, there, there are no real values, that Islam basically is that these people never really took Islam very seriously to study it seriously, but she made the mistake of thinking, well, everyone is like that, and so that means there's nothing there. And and that they, basically, Islam for them is all about their own egos. You know, they, they run these Islamic centers for the purposes of serving their own egos, feeling cool, feeling that they are, but that they're themselves empty, and. And sadly, part of it was she was there when I got kicked out of the Qureshi camp, and she was. Oh no, you got kicked out of that yeah. too. 
Oh, he's been kicked out everywhere. <laughs> and, you know, she watched the process of jealousy because I was teaching class and got very popular and, you know, and, and, uh, and I, it's actually quite sad to me that what she took from her, first she was very enthusiastic about my classes and was attending them with such passion, but when she watched me got get kicked out, then she her, she met a friend who convinced her that basically I don't represent anything other than um, an outlier. You know, it's I'm a, just a a complete curveball, but that the truth is represented by everyone else. And then, you know, from there, you take a step down, step down, step down, step down. Uh, if, she, she came, if she would have come from a wealthy family, she would have ended up being a lawyer or a doctor, but she was very smart. But because she didn't come from a wealthy family, then uh, yeah, that was the path. Um, I don't know what happened to her. I was never able to... She should have seen your example, Dr. Abufal, how you stayed strong, you know, with all these it, challenges. I mean, it, it, the problem is, uh, I wasn't, uh, I, I had encountered there in, in um, Tempe, Arizona, and in, uh, in uh, the capital, and I was there for a year, and then I, when I left, and then after I left, the, the you know, things of, but, it, you know, I continued all these years to pray that she would come back to Islam someday, and I don't know if it happened or not, but it, I wouldn't be surprised if someday I find out that she did come back to Islam. Uh, you know, it, I really take very seriously you know, you, you, you can't despair in Allah's mercy. Yes. Yeah. You, you, you must believe that ultimately when all said is all up to God and if God wants miracles to happen, God will make miracles happen. And at least you can stand before him on the day of judgment and say, I prayed to you. It was, you know, I, mean, I prayed and I did what I can. I, you know, I, I tried to be a good example. I try to to consistently be an invit open invitation to your faith, and and that's very important. I mean, I, I Subhanallah, I, I, I think for a, for a for a, a Muslim was iman. Nothing tears at the heart more than this. Um, um, I'm so grateful, Dr. Abu Fadl, because my heart was really disturbed when I was thinking, you know, you know, you get to an age where you start thinking. Yeah. And I'm thinking, how would I ever explain this to my children? You know, and my heart just, it just didn't seem right. So yeah. you're saying what I felt, but I thought, now would I be sinning, you know? So yeah, thank you so much for your open-mindedness. It's it, 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 so sad. This is, this is what, you know, this, this is the thing I take, my biggest issue was people who represent Sharia, in, you know, if you truly, if you truly are a master of your art in, in Takhrij al-Ahkam, you would bring ease and you would bring ease and justice to people because you've studied enough to know what that this the, these are the ultimate objectives of Sharia and and you and you can justify through if you're asked to produce a, a complete explanation for your reasoning through the evidence and you can produce it and you can account for it from the first step. What I don't. I don't like people who shoot from the hip but can't produce their evidence if they're required to or if asked to. And and also people who are not sufficiently adept so they think that Sharia is like, you know, driving a bulldozer. And it 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 it's inflexible and, and unmaneuverable and 
and they don't understand that the, it, it, the, it has a goal, it has an objective. And the Sharia, by definition, it, the ahkam in different places in response to different circumstances. So, you know, they, 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 and that is the, the problem is like someone who goes and studies in Saudi or Egypt or uh, West Africa and then comes here in the U.S. and then they apply what, what they've learned to the letter because it will produce injustice and it will produce ugliness and it will produce unreasonableness. And when you do that, you turn people away from the faith. Yes. And people then say, oh, this is not something that attracts us. Yeah, I, I would.